what happens when we don't pay attention. When I don't pay attention. It's my fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good morning, folks. Listen, um, we are going to talk about a ton of stuff today. Whoa. Israel is at war. Uh, that's pretty obvious. Yep. It's pretty obvious. Um, but there are tons of things happening right now that we are going to talk about. We're going to update you as into uh, what is actually happening. And folks, make no mistake about it. There is a lot happening right now. So um, we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to update you on... Uh, you know, everything that's happening right now with the uh, just the craziness, as David would call it, the Balagan that's happening. We're also going to talk about some of the problems that are erecting in the region that we know about, right? That is also of uh, grave concern. Um, and so uh, we, boy, guys, we have a lot happening right now in the current moment. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about all of the nations that are involved in this. And where this is going, we're going to talk about the demise of the United States of America with the position they're taking and everything else. So with that, before we do that, I do want to take a moment to thank you guys that are uh, doing the super chats and super stickers. Um, I just want to say this uh, right off the bat. You guys are a blessing. Your generosity is amazing. And when you do that, it goes a long way. It really does. And the support that it provides for us is tremendous for me and my family. And I also want to say this, especially for those of you guys that are contributing on um, uh, locals, it means a lot to us. It helps us and it goes a long way. Let me read a couple of the comments on super stickers and uh, super chats. Uh, Mr. Snow Wolf, you say, given Iran's current enrichment capabilities and stockpile uh, what's the possibility that they have already nuclear weapons? It's not even a possibility. I'm almost certain they have nuclear weapons. And Vindog, you say the world is uh, a sewer. <laughs> Time to go home. It is. And uh, Jackie, by the way, thank you so much. You say praying for Israel and for the rescue of the hostages. Hey, Amen. We, we forgot the hostages. Yeah. I, well, I have it and you have it. Yep. Um, I, but the other thing I want to do, too, is I want to just tell you guys, for those of you that are super chatting right now, please keep them coming. I will read them at some point later because the nature of our discussion is significant. And we have a lot that we are talking about that we have to address today. So, uh, David, I'm going to just start with you, bro. You you provided for us some really, really good uh, information in some of the videos that you recently released, which was awesome. I, uh, I'm, of course, I'm always very grateful for the material that you're putting out. You do a very, very good job. Oh, thank you. Um, and, I, and I've been very uh, blessed because I, well, quite frankly, I'm going to just pick a bone with you right now. Uh, and I know that I'm part of your production team, but I'm just going to tell you this. I wish you put out way more videos <laughs> because I'm telling you, bro, you are a wealth of information and there's a lot of great stuff that people can learn on a regular basis from your perspective. I, I, one of the things that happened with you when um, I first uh, came to Israel and I met you, gosh, now almost 10 years ago. Um, it was a long time, uh, maybe even longer than that. We were more handsome back then. Yeah. Uh, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I still think you're more handsome than me. But, uh, but, but to say the least, I can, I can tell you um, I was astounded by the time we got to like the third location, I was uh, uh, super astounded by what you were sharing because what what I what was amazing to what I was experiencing, like what was really different for me, was that um, you you were teaching at a completely different level, right? In my opinion, it's like I am listening to a guy that is telling me what the perspective is. From a military perspective, like some of the things that are going on. So your strong point has always been sharing with us, you know, the things that are happening from a military perspective. And uh, so in like, just in my opinion, you're the go-to guy for that. Like you're the guy that I want to go to when I want to get that kind of information. Well, thank you for that. I mean, I spent a lot of, <laughs> a lot of years in army boots and uniform in order to reach that. But um uh, and maybe maybe that's what we should start off with today. If what really happened on on uh, Saturday night? I mean, can can we talk about that? Okay. I, I I'm really really curious. Why don't we start with that? How about we just start with what exactly happened and and what took place? Because man, that's such a significant issue. It's a big deal. 
It is a big deal on, on a couple of levels, but again, like everything else, and I think uh, one of the things I keep on hearing about the 8th of October, the 8th of October did not start on October 8th. <laughs> okay. Um, there were a lot of things that went into what happened, and let's start off with uh, this. For Israel to pull off a defense of uh, ourselves from a all-out attack like that, meaning that we didn't start dealing with it today. We've been planning and, and getting ready for this for, for many, many years. That's one thing. Two, um, for everything to work in the concentrated way that it mattered, um, Iron Dome, Arrow, and all the rest of the different layers that, that played a part in what happened, we need God's dome above us. I mean, the fact that God used the Iron Dome in order to defend Israel... Uh, is amazing that <clears throat> the integration between all the different systems, and maybe we can talk about what exactly happened, what did what, and who and why. Oh. Okay? But it doesn't work like that without a massive machinery and, 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 and rotation and, 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 and changing that God's been doing over the years. So let's do this, because I know that most people are aware of uh, the events that took place. Uh, it would be Saturday evening for us, uh, early Sunday morning for you guys uh, in Israel. Um, let's talk about exactly what happened, okay? The media is actually telling us that we were looking at roughly 300 incoming items in one way or another. We know now that there were substantially more than that, or close to 500. We know that. Um, we also know that there are a lot of uh, implications that arise out of this. By the way, I want to take a moment to say this. If you guys did not do it, I would recommend that you go to David's initial video that he released on Saturday. I would also highly recommend that you do two other things. I would recommend that you go to our Calvary Chapel Signal Hill live page, mm -hmm. and I think Dale will uh, create a link for that. Uh, Dale, do a direct link to the Calvary Chapel Signal Hill live page uh, where I taught Revelation Sunday morning, and I do the um, and I do the uh, summary of what was going on in Israel. I would go subscribe over there and watch that. The other thing that I would ask you to do is go to my YouTube page and pull yesterday's video. And I think Dale will make a link to that as well because on yesterday's video, I spent roughly 35 minutes, maybe a little bit more than that, talking about the implications of all of the things that happened, especially with respect to what took place with Russia, the uh, recent stand that they took, and some of the other things that were being communicated there. Um, so so we had 500 incoming. We're talking about missiles. We're talking about uh, not rockets, missiles. We're talking about drones. Um, no, well, let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my mom, okay, because <laughs> I was in contact with my mom the whole thing. It starts off in the evening when we get um, the information that there is a swarm of drones that left Iran, and it's on its way to Israel. They were talking about maybe 100 and something drones, more than 100 drones. And and just so you get the idea, a swarm of drones like this, a drone of those, you know, those Delta Wing drones that we see in the, in the that Iran is selling to the Russians to use in Ukraine now, those big Delta Wing things that they fire in swarms, takes about six hours, six or seven hours to do the thousand miles from Iran to, to Israel. So, so... A swarm of drones goes up into the air, and everybody in Israel knows what's going on. So the first thing I do is call my mom, okay? And I said, listen, you've got 100 high-explosive rockets on the way to Israel. Okay, what are you doing? She says, well, I checked that there's water in the—every the, uh, the we, every house in Israel has a little the shelter, shelter in, the, yeah. in the shelter. And, and what I'm trying to say is Israel was getting ready. It's not like it happened, you know, surprisingly. It's not a 9-11 kind of event, okay, where all of a sudden you open up the radio and you see it. We we had a six hour um, how do you say uh, preparation for what was happening. The thing is that a drone, which is a slow flying, it flies about a hundred miles an hour. Okay, is it's going to take a couple of hours to reach Israel, but we knew that the drones are not the whole story. So together with the drones, there's going to be other munitions, other assets, um, and they fired a couple hundred cruise missiles. Yep which are um, rockets that kind of fly and, and hug the terrain. 
uh, as opposed to a drone, which has actually it has a motorcycle engine on the back of it. A, a cruise missile has a jet engine. But the most dangerous of all of the different aspects are the ballistic missiles. That's right. Yep. And a ballistic missile is a missile that actually is fired more or less straight up into the stratosphere. And it comes down in free fall and it comes down very, very fast. And, and it was time. The whole thing is time. We know that. For all of these more hundred, five hundred munitions, we're talking about seventy tons of high explosives. Okay, that would probably be zeroing in on Israel altogether, mm. and that's how it all started off. Okay, um, uh, I, I am astounded by the fact that our, uh, I'll just call it evil president, because he is right. Almost immediately. Uh, before even the dust settles, <clears throat> before they could probably get that Bedouin girl to the hospital, makes a statement that tells Israel, do not retaliate against Iran. Now, I am disgusted by that statement because how in the living uh, heck do you not retaliate against Iran when Iran launches 500 items representing 70 tons of explosives to your country. Well, I can show you how you're doing it. I'm going to do my Biden and, uh, improvisation here. He said, don't. Yeah, he's nuts. Well, here's the thing. He's a kook. Okay. He said, don't. And what did they do? Yeah, Iran did it. They did. Yep. I mean, he reminds 100%. me, he reminds me of a father who tells, you know, his son, don't drop that plate. And he looks in, in, in his sons and says, don't do that. You know, it's going to be a problem. And his son looks him in the eyes and drops the plate. Yeah, just while he's looking at him in the eyes. Exactly. He just goes, blink. Yeah. Now what, Dad? What are yeah. you going to say? What are you going to do? And, yep. and again, and, and, and one of the things that I think people need to realize is that Iran allowed itself to do that because there's no leadership. That's right. A yeah. son, a child is going to do that because he's not afraid of the repercussions. He doesn't understand. He he feels that, you know, you're saying don't, but there's nothing behind it. And he's basically saying, OK, let's see what you're going to do now. And basically, because our administration here is so uh, Biden-ish, uh, is that a word? Biden-ish. <laughs> I, it, uh, <laughs> I'll leave that be. Go ahead, bro, because you almost lit a match in me. I'm, I, I almost okay. said something I was going to regret, but because, go ahead. Because it's so much like that, then Iran is saying the United States of America, the biggest military power in the world, the strongest economy in the world, the, 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 the world economy uh, currency, says to me, don't, and I did it. I need to get your mic closer to you. There I you need go. you to talk a little louder. I guess uh, they're not hearing you clear enough. And what does that say? That in itself. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to try to force some stuff out of you that might be more beneficial for, for people. How about we start with this? Tell me how likely, from a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is it that Israel is going to retaliate? Uh, ten. No, Israel. I okay. think. Uh, All yeah, right. Maybe. Maybe a nine. On I'm a scale. Gonna... On a scale of one to ten, how likely is it that Israel is going to retaliate within the next week? Um, probably. Give me a scale. Give me a number. No, probably. Ten uh, meaning highly likely. One meaning nine. unlikely. Nine. So nine. Okay. Um. Uh. On a scale of one to ten, will Israel? Uh, how likely is it that Israel will retaliate in a way that actually destroys assets that's a in good one. Iran? That's a good one, and, and and that would probably be up to grabs. Okay, and, and here's a good... Uh, Give me Israel. a number. Give me a number. What would you think? Well, how... Meaning 10, highly likely, zero... No, okay, meaning, uh, let's unlikely. put it this way. How much pain does Israel want to inflict on Iran because of this? Okay? But that's a different question. How likely is it that they're going to actually destroy... like? Do something other than, you know, just send something that doesn't make it into airspace or anything like that, kind of like what Iran did. I'd probably say no. We, we need Iran to understand that there's a price to this, so I'm going to say probably about an eight. Okay, so an eight. Okay. Um, how likely is it that uh, there's going to be a mass amount of civilian casualties? In Iran? In Iran. No, that's probably lower. They might do something where they would say, okay, we're going to take out this refinery. And we're going to shoot it in three hours, and Iran's not going to be able to do anything about it. 
but they might, I mean, move people out in order for there not to be massive casualties. Mm -hmm. Is Iran, uh, and I already know the answer to this question, but is Iran similar to Hamas in the way that they manage their civilians? Oh, totally, okay. totally. Okay, so, so they will put civilians say, in front just yeah, to get the better news story. Let, let's say we're going to say, okay, there's a drone factory. You fire drones at us, we're going to go hit the drone manufacturing factory. Okay, and we know the drone manufacturing is here, okay, uh, and we're going to be hitting that facility because of it's connected to the attack. And we're going to say, if you want people to be killed, then leave them there. If you don't want them to be killed, move them out. Iran might put their people there. Okay. Uh, okay. All that, knowing all of that, ask me this. Um, uh, what are some... Uh, well, let's start with this. Give us an update on currently what's happening over there. Like, where, where are things at? What is Netanyahu saying? What is the cabinet saying? What, what, uh, what's the war footing? What's it look like? Give us, the, give us that update first, let's and then off, we'll, go, we'll go further. Let's start off with here, by the okay. way. Now Biden is saying to Israel again, don't. Yeah. Okay, and, and again, why does he think that Iran doesn't need to listen to him, and we should listen yeah, to him? Yeah, he said not. We're not going to listen there, to him. By the way, it's not only him, the rest of the world. Everybody's yeah. lining up and saying, don't. I mean, everybody's lining up and said, oh, you're not hurt, and then don't get them back. Yeah. But they don't understand that I live in a gang-infested neighborhood. And yep. if I don't retaliate, it's only a matter of time till it comes again. 100%. That's number one. Number two, the cabinet has already decided on the reaction. According to Ynet, which is probably about three or four hours ago, the cabinet has decided on a reaction, and the only question is when. Three, uh, America is really, really worried about it. That's why they want us to coordinate with them. Okay, so America— Which we won't do. Israel Israel's Israel, not going to do that. Well, we didn't coordinate with them the, uh, the taking out of the general in Damascus that started off this whole thing. And let's get back to that subject because I got something really interesting about that one to connect to. But basically, just like the Americans didn't tell us that they took out Suleimani, who was the guy's boss. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and that's another d dynamic that's connected in Baghdad when they did that. But again— um, so, so the reaction is ready. We know what we're going to do. The only question is who, uh, is when, and the world is standing up and, and holding its breath. Everybody understands Israel needs to retaliate, but everybody is saying don't do it. Um, one of the main aspects that Israel is taking in consideration is the, the, how do you say, the allies in the Middle East. I mean, remember, those drones went through Jordanian and Saudi airspace. And Saudi Arabia and Jordan uh, and, and Saudi assisted Arabia Israel. assisted Israel in, in shooting down some of them, or at least uh, allowing us to shoot down a lot of them. There were F-35s in Jordanian airspace while this was happening. It's yeah. really, Israeli F-35s. Yeah, I know. Okay, and so, Jordan so said, let's go. Nobody's going to say that, but we did shoot down. What Israel is saying is that horde of drones actually was shot down before it reached Israeli airspace. That's right by Americans, Saudis, Jordanians, French, by the way, found yeah. out a little while ago, uh, British, and, and Israeli pilots. Yes. So, so it was a very good... But And I was surprised to hear that the French had a significant portion to do in the area that was uh, like the southern portion of Jordan, just north of Syria. They were very, very invested in that area. Exactly. And which was really amazing to think about. Like, I mean, well, <laughs> we forget that there are European assets. There are, there are Western yeah. world assets all over the Middle East. And, and again, uh, Iran is playing this very... I mean, they flew... Th those drones flew over American bases. I mean, think about that. They had to flow, fly over American bases in Iraq. They had to fly over American bases in Syria in order to get here. What did they think? That was not going to happen. A lot of people are actually playing this game that um, uh, Iran didn't want this to succeed. That's not true. They, they invested probably about 10, maybe even 15% of their arsenal of long-range munitions. They did not expect to come out of this with zero gain. I do have to give you or uh, read to you an article that is interesting that I want to get your reaction uh, for um, that is is uh, uh, really critical, okay? Uh, hold on a second. Let me. I, I guess my understanding is you're still very quiet. Do, 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 yeah, you need to get a little one, louder. One, two, three. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me make sure that the right... Okay, I am that's here. It. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, uh, I... Let me see here. Uh... Uh, th this 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 is a particular interest. By the way, this is on memory. 
Uh, they they release highly this. recommended. Yeah, they're, no, they do a great job. They they do a really really good job, right? Um, so uh, Ain Al Assad or Ain Al Assad basically says that Iran pre coordinated its attack against Israel with the United States. Well, here's the thing: we know that they pre coordinated with the Turks. Turkey knew beforehand. Now, Turkey, don't forget, is part of NATO. I mean, it doesn't make sense that you tell Turkey and Turkey wouldn't tell the United States. So whether they told the United States directly or they actually told the Turks and they knowing that the Turks would tell the United States, yes, this was a pre-coordinated. And, and, and let's go back again. We, we, we're still on the ground here. Tell me when you want to go to the Goodyear blimp kind of level and we got to go into that and see what, what's going on because there's a lot connected to that well this one this one's a big deal because if that is the case there's a whole lot of other implications that we have to talk about uh especially when we start talking about how iran was funded to do this in the first place yep. and the united states of america is complicit in that action it's a major it's a major issue can we talk about funding that's an interesting point yeah it's a, how it's much a it big cost major Israel, issue. how much it cost to and how much it cost iran oh yeah yeah let me get this right in front of you right just there? like that yeah How's there that? we go how much did it cost Iran? It cost Iran a couple billion dollars. I mean, Easily. think about this. Okay, Easily. but it cost Israel a couple billion dollars. All day. Okay, who's going to get the money back? $1.73 billion is, is the number that I heard that Israel had to spend yeah, okay. in order here's to defend itself. Israel used Iron Dome for the short range and, and, and uh, the, the uh, cruise missiles. It used David Sling, which is an intermediate-ranged anti-ballistic uh, missile. It used the Aero system, which is a long-range, I will intercept you in outer space kind of missile. It used the uh, C version of the Iron Dome, meaning Iron Dome that's on ships, by the way, which is very, very... And do you know that we're going to be selling that all over the world for the next 50 years? Oh yeah. So Israel's going Israel Israel's going to make money off of this. This is this is the weird thing that a lot of people don't really understand. Israel has the only combat proven anti-ballistic missile system in the world. Yeah, that's right. Israel has the only combat proven anti-cruise missile system in the world. A combat proven. I mean that's 99%. Right. That's right. Even even it, more proven than the Patriot missile system that we yeah, have in the United totally. States of America. Okay. So so I, 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 I'm not worried about the, the economy of this as much as, okay, we, we need to now rebuild. And, and let's put it this. Iron Dome interceptors are manufactured in Israel and in the States, Rayathon. But the Arrow, the David Sling, the rest of them are manufactured in Israel. We don't need America to defend ourselves. Good. I mean, I, 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 I just say good because it is. It is. It's really, really good. It's really, really good. I think that that's really important. And And... Again, I can't. I, I'm going to stress the 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 uh, the fact that the planning that's gone into this, the preparation that's gone into this. I mean, Israel was actually dealing with a barrage of long range ballistic missiles, and look at we've we've managed to deal with this. And yes, Iran might do something bigger and greater than that, but we feel a little bit more secure about this. But uh, I want to say thank you. To all of the people all over the world, and this is one of the things that I've been stressing lately, we felt your prayers that day. Oh, and, yeah. And, and, and it wouldn't have worked without God's meshing all the different parts of the machinery together in a very unique manner. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very, very blessed to see that, that, is, uh, uh, that that's the case. And I think that there's, it's great to see how God protected you guys and how his hand protected you. Uh, we've been seeing the hand of God protecting people that are making righteous stands. I want to really quickly just thank uh, Don. Don, thank you on uh, Rumble. Uh, you say, God bless Israel. May he protect his people uh, and the land. Amen. Thank you for that. And Virginia, thank you as well. Uh, you say, thank you for educating us like you do. Uh, I have learned uh, so much and depend on my relationship with the Lord because of your teachings, constantly praying for you, your family, your ministry in Israel. Thank you. It means a lot. And um, we are always we're always grateful for your encouragement. We've got a we're getting in a lot more super chats and stuff. I'll read those a little bit later, but I just wanted to acknowledge those. Um, uh, okay, so let me ask you this question because this is like a, a really uh, uh, something a lot of people are asking. What's next? What before, happens? Can can I back up before we get to that? We'll get to that. But yeah. I want I want to stress something that I'm not hearing enough, and this is drive as an Israeli is driving me crazy. Um, we all know that when you kill somebody, you should be punished. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> that's that's the basic idea. I don't know if I'm demonetizing us right now as we talk about this. But I'm going to say something that a lot of people aren't hearing. 
attempted murder is still a crime. It's a major crime. And and here's the thing. The world is saying, oh, they tried. They didn't do it. <clears throat> okay. And and what are we, turning this into another Jewish holiday? I mean, yeah. you, you know what a Jewish holiday oh, is. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They tried to kill us. They, they didn't did kill us. Let's we celebrate. Eat. No, we don't want to celebrate. We don't. <laughs> Okay, what I'm trying to say is, why isn't the world saying that this attempt is is a horrific crime? Why isn't the United Nations yelling? Why don't because we hear they're condemnation? Because they're anti Semitic devils. That's I why. I get that. But what I'm trying to say is, this should be, how do you say, stressing the dissonance between the truth and the non truth. You want another dissonance that I find amazing? Okay, what is Iran's justification for this attack? Their justification is uh, the death of the 16 IRGC officials oh. in that in the Al Quds building. But the problem with that is that that guy was the mastermind of what happened on October the seventh. Exactly. So, so, so what? what? They are saying that this guy planned the massacre of October the seventh. He was the mastermind, the, the Iranian mastermind behind it. He is. Uh, you know, our version of bin Laden, okay? And here's the thing. What, were, you didn't take out bin Laden in Pakistan? Okay. Listen, listen, listen. Because I'm going to get very, uh, this is a touchy issue for me, okay? Not only is this guy the highest ranking IRGC, or let me just say this, the most important IRGC asset that they have had, right? This is the man who has been actively trading Hezbollah. Now, mind you, this is El Quds. They're a completely different terrorist what does organization. Mean? It, 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 we, we in Arabic we say Al Quds, which it's Jerusalem. Why is a, is Iranian have a unit named after Jerusalem? Because their whole goal is to destroy if they cannot take possession of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's the, the that's thing. the whole goal. But let me take it a step further because I, I want to say this because like this is really critical. This guy, this guy is also the one that is credited for training Hezbollah in the north to keep. Israeli citizens away from the northern border where the southern Lebanon is. As a matter of fact, he's also the one responsible for the uh, continuity that he's created between Damascus and Beirut. People are now, Hezbollah is now entering into and leaving Lebanon through the central uh, eastern portion of the country because of this guy. This guy also orchestrated the attack on the American base that killed the soldiers. That's right. Your soldiers, That's American right. soldiers. Let, let's make this clear. This guy is not a peacekeeper, one. Number two, the building that he was killed in was not the embassy. That's it right. Was, I mean, I can show you a picture. And it's an auxiliary building. It's an auxiliary building. Number three, okay? They said that he, this attack was a result of, and they're, they're basically saying, we will... Uh, reply to this attack on Iranian sovereign property because it was in an embassy. They feel that they are justified. I'm going to remind you of something a lot of people have forgotten. 1992, a car blows up in front of the Israeli embassy in oh, Buenos yeah. Aires in Argentina. Okay, six months ago, the Argentinian high court actually passed a verdict that that attack was instigated by Iran. That's right. And we know on that. an embassy, and Iran, and their, it, Iran doesn't. Um, not to interrupt you, I'm just telling you, Iran doesn't dispute that. And and they're using the attack on their embassy as an excuse to attack Israel. Okay, and and here's the thing: what would the United States of America do if, as a result of you taking out, let's say, Soleimani in in Baghdad? Okay, Iraq fired ballistic missiles at downtown Washington D.C. Oh, it would be. What there would, would be no country. What would you say if Pakistan decided to put a nuclear warhead on one of their long-range missiles and shoot that into Missouri because you took out Osama bin Laden in Pakistani territory? Now, the doublespeak is driving me as an Israeli crazy. I mean, why isn't nobody saying, wait a minute, you attacked embassies. You've done it. Right. How are you using this as an excuse? And which brings us to what Iran actually was trying to do, and that's a bigger discussion that we have to get into a little bit later. Yeah, so the, uh, I, and, and the other problem that I have, and it's a significant one, and it's one that I guess, uh, again, 
Um, I don't know why this is not being widely discussed. Uh, it, it makes it, it's very difficult for me to process why this kind of nonsense is not being widely discussed. But they, Iran has been saying it from the very beginning. They're saying it. They, they're not, they're, it's not, there's no question. They're saying death to America, death to Israel. They keep saying it again and again and again and again and again. So what we're dealing with if if I'm understand is the uh, the Chamberlain effect, okay? This is the world is saying. Wait a minute, we've got peace, we've got relative quiet. We don't believe that there are bad players in this yeah. dynamic, and and let's see if we can appease them. Let's see if we can kind of pay them. Let's see if we can stroke their their egos, and let's see if we can do something that will not allow this to blow up in our faces. Now here's the thing: Biden is in the middle of an election. Europe has a serious Muslim problem in its own people. And look what's going on in, in Europe with, with the Muslims in Europe. And everybody is saying, for our reasons, we want this to die down. Hmm. Okay? For internal European and internal United States reasons, everybody wants this to die down. So basically, everybody is saying to Israel, just take it. Yeah. No way. And, and No way. No way. How is Israel? I'm not. I'm not a fan of encouraging war at any level. War stinks. It stinks. But if Israel doesn't act, if Israel doesn't immediately retaliate, I mean, what? Like I, to me, I'll tell you what shocks me. I'm, I'm very shocked by this, and I know this is not Israel style, but it still shocks me. Right? Israel, since 1973, has never experienced a large scale attack like the one that they experienced. A few days ago, how in the world did Israel not immediately send all kinds of assets into Iran? Because of the United States. One reason. OK, Let, let's back up. When Osama bin Laden blew up buildings in the United States and, and put you through a terrible ordeal, America went and conquered Afghanistan. We're completely completely devastated Afghanistan. I mean, whatever you can. And, and again, you cannot in this world, and if they had not retaliated to 9-11, okay, how many more Muslim organizations, Muslim countries, Muslim crazies would have stood up and said, okay, I mean, you know, if, if this is what happens when they blow up, you know, uh, the, the, the Twin Towers, then what else is going to happen? I mean, what's going to happen to us? When you see somebody drop the plate after he'd been told not to, okay, not only will that child not understand that there's consequences to his actions, his brothers, his cousins, his friends will understand that they can do the same. Okay, well, here's a bigger problem. Let me, let me, let me run a name to you, right? Because this one bothers me, and this happened yesterday. I did a video, by the way, on this on Saturday. I'm putting oh, the article yeah. up in front of you, right? Uh, this one drives me crazy with Muhammad Shia al Sudani. That drives me crazy enough. You guys don't know the name uh, al Sudani. It should ring a bell when I mention a country, and that is Iraq. And I want everybody to understand this. The prime minister of Iraq was sitting with the president of the United States on Monday, <laughs> less than 24 hours, 30 hours after Iran actively attacks. Israel, you have Mohammed Shia Sudani sitting down in the Oval Office with Joe Biden negotiating nonsense. By the way, that's significant. I want people to understand that because Iraq and Iran are very close. And they're close for a lot of reasons. I'm not even going to get into the Balagan that exists in the, in the Gulf that uh, the closeness with Iran and Iraq have to be. But there are so many other issues that exist there that are really important. And when you look at uh, uh, Sudani and you see some of the things that he has encouraged and he has supported, the biggest thing that he's known for right now is the aggressive action that he has taken towards the elimination of the Kurds to the north <laughs> in Iraq. And if the Kurds are being eliminated in Iraq, it means we want to destroy the United States of America. Yet that guy is sitting down with the president of the United States of America. Why? Because they hate Christians. Totally. The, the, uh, Al Sudani hates Christians. We haven't talked about Tucker yet. Oh, oh my goodness. That, that's a whole other, we should probably, <laughs> yeah. You, he hates Christians. And then the other thing is, is that he, 
his whole purpose for eliminating all of those people in northern Iraq is to eliminate the influence of not only believers, but to eliminate the influence of the United States of America. Because the presence that we have in Iraq is, in essence, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, it is, it's, it's spearheaded in northern Iraq. And, and we are literally looking at, you ready? We're looking at another Afghanistan here. It's on the way. Yep. Okay, so, so the ring of fire. And again, this is, this is a war going on. Um, here, here's, here's Goodyear blimp. Okay, let's, let's go up. What's, what's actually happening? What is Iran trying to pull off? Why did they do this haphazard, okay, here it comes. Uh, we're doing it at 5 o'clock. Uh, be ready. Uh, here it comes. What, what are we going to do? What's the game that you think media, they're playing? Media, 100%. Okay. It's the media war. Okay, but why not? Why not fire? I mean, if you really, if you want to make an issue, why not fire? If you're going to spend uh, five hundred different types of munition, why not make an effort to to do something? Now, here's don't the answer. Me here's the answer. It's really easy. Yeah, I'll make it very, very easy. Iran understands that it takes money to make money. Okay, and Iran is more than willing to spend that kind of money to be able to receive the kind of funding that they know they're going to receive in order to calm down. And they're not going to calm down. That's exactly what's happening. What is Iran lacking to start this all going off? And this is where I'm going with this. Uh, the one thing that Iran is lacking more than anything is the support that it needs to be able to do it from the international community. No, nope. I think one thing is Iraq is lacking and Iran is lacking. And, and this is the reason it's not really exploded. They don't have the nuclear option yet. Well, I mean, I understand that they don't have the nuclear option, but the problem with that is the moment they gain the nuclear option, then Iran, uh, then Israel will not be the only one striking them. Okay. All right. But again, it's still not an option. I mean, if this all had been playing out, and this is what I'm kind of, as an Israeli, I'm thinking about. If everything that we've seen has been playing out with a nuclear option on the table for Iran, meaning there is a bomb somewhere in in Iran somewhere that can be fired or will be fired at Israel. Or think about this. Those 500 rockets, drones, and ballistic missiles that came in, if they had a nuclear option and you didn't know if one of them didn't have a nuclear tip on it. Oh, yeah? The situation would have been completely different. I think Iran is buying time until they get the nuclear option. Okay, here's my question. Uh... Uh, you don't you don't believe at all by or by any stretch of the imagination that they have a nuclear option in front of them right now? I think their behavior says at least publicly that they don't have. But let's see if you can convince me otherwise. <sighs> Your country believes they have a nuclear option already. No, we country believes that they're in what we call a two week breakout uh, option, which means they could pull it together in two weeks, but they haven't done it yet. Okay, so here's my question then. It's the famous question, right? Mm -hmm. Why haven't they done it then? If, if, they, if they believe that, that Iran can do it in two weeks and you say that that's the only thing holding them back, why haven't they done it? I think there's something lacking. What are they missing? Ooh, uh, did you see the Piers Morgan thing? No, what Piers Morgan thing? With, uh, uh, how do you say, the Young Turk guy? Oh, the Young Turk guy is... Oh, uh, the old... Yeah, he's that guy. I saw that one. He's... The, the Young Turk guy is... Um, I, I don't even take him seriously anymore. He's running for president. He's not going to... He doesn't... He's, what he's mean, not, what do you he's mean a, he doesn't? Biden is he's, president. He's a joke. He's not even... Bro, he's not even going to be on the ballot in three quarters of the states. Not to mention the fact that he is, in many ways... In my opinion, the guy is a super intelligent guy. Like, I think he's really, really smart, but he's just too too blind by his hatred to make any kind of sense. Like, he shows his lack of intelligence or his lack of wisdom in applying his intelligence by the uh, by the foolishness of his of his hatred for Israel. He's he's a he's a deeply so anti-Semitic man. So let's get back to our subject. What is Iran waiting for? Funding. I, I think Iran is waiting for the opportunity to um, to be able to act without without w without the fear or the concern that there will be reprisal for their actions. 
So they want to attack Israel and not feel reprisals. Yes. Well, they're close to it. I mean, look at this. The whole world is tying our foot to the to the post. The whole world is saying don't. By the way, what's MBS saying? I want to bring you to this because it was it was one of my favorite parts of this interview, this MBS interview that took place. And I'm going to see if I can get to it, get to the portion where he's asked about nuclear weapons. Uh, let me see if I can if I can get this. Hold on. Let MBS is dying for it. Yeah, well, but look at what he says regarding the subject of nuclear weapons. I'm going to see if I can find that that moment where he gets asked about it. Uh, let me see here. Let me see if I can do this really quickly. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, because uh, what he says about the subject of nuclear weapons is is really, really important. As a matter of fact, you know what? I know that there's one area where I can find it. Hold on mm. a second. Um, but but what he says MBS about MBS Mohammed weapons, bin Salman, the uh, how do you say crown prince? The crown what, prince. What do you call him? The, the crown, crown prince, prince of Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Of Saudi Arabia. The crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Okay, let me do this here really quickly. Uh, Which this, basically this, is the guy running the Saudi government. Yeah, yeah, Saudi of course. Government. Yeah, of course. Uh, and by the way, becoming more and more respected uh, by the Saudi <laughs> government uh, by the day. Even though he by the know. Saudi people by yeah. the day. By the Saudi people or the world? I mean, is the world respecting even, him? Even his own family are beginning to really respect him. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, that's, it's... That's saying a lot because, it you is. know, family, it is. family politics sometimes can get very, very complicated, well, especially as I know in well. The, especially in the royal family. Yeah. Especially in oh, Saudi no. Arabia. It's a, it's a, it's and, a, and it's, you know, every, every son has, I mean, he, the, I think somebody I heard, he says he's got something like 56 cousins. And each one is a political player that he has to deal with, and and most, if not all, respect him. Listen, listen to this. Let me let me play this really quickly. Okay, this is very interesting. What he says, uh, I talked about this by when the way. I did a video on this. Any country getting a nuclear weapon, that's a bad, uh, uh, that's a bad uh, uh, move. Let me give you context behind this. He got okay. asked by Brett Baer, "Are you concerned with Iran developing nuclear weapons?" Oh. So this is his response to that statement. Uh, when he got asked about that, okay, so when just... we are concerned of any country getting a nuclear weapon, that's a bad, uh, uh, that's a bad uh, uh, move, and you don't need to get a nuclear weapon because you cannot use it. Even if Iran get a nuclear weapon, any country use a nuclear weapon, that means they are having a war with the rest of the world. The world cannot see another Hiroshima. Okay, so I'm going to stop this for just a second. So this is the <coughs> this is the problem that Iran has. <coughs> it isn't that it has the ability to use a nuclear weapon. It's the fact that they do not want to be in a position where they use a nuclear weapon and the whole world fights against them. Remember, when you, when you start looking at the mindset of the Shia Muslims, mm -hmm. their whole goal is world domination, not world destruction. Yeah. Okay? So it's very different than the Sunni mindset. The Sunni mindset is we'll take everybody with us if we have to. <laughs> The, the the Shia mindset is slightly different. So he's you heard <coughs> Muhammad bin Shalomin actually say right Even here. Even if I have a weapon, I can't use it. Yeah, and he and he you heard him say it. He made it very clear. He says if they use the weapon, then the whole world is getting involved. So no country is going to use the weapon. But look at the follow up question that gets brought to him. Okay, this is interesting. Having a war with the rest of the world, the world cannot see another Hiroshima. If the world see one hundred thousand people dead. That means you are in a war with the rest of the world. So it's a useless uh, uh, effort to reach a nuclear uh, weapon because you cannot use it. If you use it, you got to have a big fight with the rest of the world. If they get one, will you? If they get one, we have to get one for hmm. security reasons and for balancing power in the uh, Middle East. But we don't want to see that. You see that? So if, if, if they get one then we have to get one. He didn't say, if they get one, then maybe we'll consider. No, if they get one, we have to get one. Okay. So, the, the, I mean, I'm telling you, right? And, and by the way, I mean, let's, let's not joke with each other, okay? Uh, we know that Saudi Arabia is definitely working towards a nuclear program. We, oh, we already know totally. that. Totally, but they're and, not the only ones. I mean, everybody's yeah. trying. Okay, so, so let's, let's go a little bit deeper, see if we can pull this off. Why does Israel have a nuclear weapon? Well, we know why Israel has a nuclear weapon. Israel right. has a nuclear weapon because Israel understands that without one, their ability to be able to survive is going to be deeply mitigated. And they know that one of the greatest ways 
or the greatest methods of being able to survive is the function of determent. And if I have a nuclear weapon in my possession, then my ability to be able to deter people from messing with me because I have a nuclear weapon is something that is paramount to their survival, considering the fact that they're in a terrible neighborhood and they're surrounded by nothing but enemies. Okay, but it didn't help us with Hamas. Yeah, but Hamas, again, <laughs> hey, look, Hamas did a lot of damage, okay? Uh, uh, guaranteed, they did a lot of damage, but Hamas is, is, is like a little, uh, I mean, Hamas is nothing which, compared to the, to, the, to the kind of power that many of these other nations have. Yeah, which brings me to something else. And again, Israel with Hamas, uh, you with Al-Qaeda, okay? Yeah. Al-Qaeda wasn't going to conquer the United States of America. No. All right? Al-Qaeda wasn't going to wipe the United States of America off the map. I mean, Al-Qaeda wasn't a physical... Uh, but it did hurt deeply. And it turns out that even, and, and what I'm seeing in this war, look at the Yemenites. The stupid Houthis with a couple of missiles sitting on the corner of nowhere in the middle of nothing with eating rice, you know, on the floor, managing to put pressure on the whole world, okay? We are living in a time where it's not the big massive armies that fought World War II anymore. It's not the military power of, of the Japan, Japanese and, and the Americans. The technology is allowing pinpricks to be much more painful and much more dangerous than ever before. So I look, look, I agree and I disagree with you both at the same time. Okay. Amen. Let me tell you why I agree and disagree. I agree with, with that statement that you just made. But the application of that statement is where me and you might be looking at things a little bit differently. Let me explain my position, right? Okay. Prior to uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, mm -hmm. okay, the uh, the governments of the world utilized conventional military warfare as the tool that they uh, uh, use to manipulate a specific political outcome, okay? Mm -hmm. So that it's a far-out statement to say to some people because some people are naive enough to think that that's not the case. But the military-industrial complex has always been the type of tool that gets used by leaders, uh, whether or not they're perceived as being good, corrupt, or not corrupt, to be able to, to pursue a very specific outcome. When nuclear weapons came into play, we learned from what happened in Cuba with Russia and the United States, the Cuban Missile Crisis, that that function of, uh, of the military-industrial complex no longer works for obtaining a military outcome. And the reason why we learned that is because we came this close to the whole world being destroyed by nuclear weapons. 1962, the, the Cuban uh, Crisis. It, that's right. So when, uh, when under Kennedy this happened and they realized that there was a much bigger lesson that was learned. And the bigger lesson that was learned, which in essence started the real Cold War, the bigger lesson that was learned was that nuclear proliferation was something that was going to keep most uh, governments from pursuing the, the larger scale military industrial complex in order to produce a specific uh, outcome because the effects of the utilization of that would be far too detrimental, right? This is why we have a space force now. This is why we're doing Star Wars types military programs. This is why all these things are going on, okay? So with that said, one major thing came to the surface with 9-11. And what came to the surface with 9-11 is that governments realized, matter of fact, I'm going to take this a little further. I don't think it started with 9-11. I think it started with the World Trade Center bombing, bombing that took place in the mid-90s, okay. okay? As a matter of fact, I'll take it even further. I think that it probably started in Beirut. That's where I think. I, I think it with started the in, up of the with the blowing up of the Marine barracks. I think it started with Beirut. And, and I'm going to tell you why. When, when a government wants to affect a, a, a very uh, specific outcome regarding a, a particular issue, they will utilize the war footing that they can produce in order to bring or rally a group of people together to produce that kind of outcome. This is why, by the way, let me just make myself very clear. This is why Zelensky in Ukraine is such an evil, demonic, wicked man. Because he is taking full advantage of the war footing in order to not only expand his political prowess, he's using the war footing in order to make himself one of the richest men in the world. Okay? And, mind you, we have videos. We have videos of him saying, 
we will not have an election because we have to be concerned about winning this war against Russia. He stopped at his own election. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave that be because everybody and their mama knows that Ukrainians would have hands down, the ones that are still alive, <laughs> would have hands down voted for somebody other than Zelensky that would immediately sit down with Russia and make a peace treaty and move forward. Okay. Yes, they lost land. So let me tell you what happens. So when they realize that this doesn't work, right? It doesn't work for mass casualties to take place. Look, America doesn't care about the mass casualties in Ukraine. And the reason why they don't care about the mass casualties in Ukraine is because they understand that the function of their uh, clandestine uh, complex, right? Their, their clandestine operations cannot be compromised because it's the function okay. of American clandestine, uh, clandestine operations that that causes certain nations in that region to stay at bay with respect to what America desires. So that's not the issue here. The bigger issue, the one that's more significant, the one that actually means something, is that this pinprick technology that you're talking about, this thing where you have Al-Qaeda, for example, or, or uh, 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 Hamas or whatever, these organizations were built by larger governments. Yep. They were created by larger governments in order to affect this type of outcome. For example, we could have shut down Al-Qaeda quickly when Afghanistan and Russia took place. When Russia was in Afghanistan and there was a lot of this going on, we could have shut any of that down. Instead, what we did was we created it. The United States of America actually created Osama bin Laden. They created Al-Qaeda. They created the machine of Al-Qaeda and based on based on their knowledge of the internal operations of that organization, they watched Al Qaeda like a like a hawk. So when 9/11 took place, I'm going to venture to say that the Bush administration, very specifically, may have turned the other way to let that happen. And and the, the only reason why I'm saying that is because it was instant. I'm, look, let me let me make myself very very clear. The Patriot Act was created as a result of what happened on 9-11. The Patriot Act, which was hundreds, if not thousands of pages, was on the table to be voted on within a day or two of when this whole happened. I promise you that act was not created right after 9-11. I promise you that it was in the wings. It had been created significantly before that time. I can promise you that, right? So, and so, so what, you're what happened is, on 9-11 was the justification for them to utilize it, which, by the way, is the whole reason why we have a FISA court right now. It's the whole reason why, um, you know, uh, our former president was spied on. It's, it's, it's that whole complex, and it was created by what happened on 9-11. So that's how people are doing this now. So this thing that's going on with Iran, this whole thing that's happening with Iran is a function of other countries wanting to pursue an outcome, not recognizing what, that Iran what is, the is serious outcome about. They wanna, what is the outcome they're trying to get? And what, it depends, what is Iran? It depends what's on the what, game? It depends on what country you're talking to. Okay, so so what's Iran trying to get out of this? Okay, well, Iran is trying to get out the obvious. They want to kill. They, they want to destroy Israel, and they want to destroy the United States of America, and they're going to do anything that they can to make that happen. Why do they want that? I mean, what, what do they get out of I that? I mean, come on. We know. I mean, there, that's a whole other discussion. There are spiritual implications of this. This is Islam. There's there's a lot that's there. Iran is the only is the only country in this whole group that is just dead set serious upon, I am just, I will not be satisfied until America is destroyed and until Israel is destroyed. But again, it's how they're trying to get there Does that's Iran going to be think different. that they can destroy America? Yes. How? 100%. The same way lots of other countries think they can destroy America. From the implosion that's happening right now, that's how. Okay, but again, I mean, look at history. Did Japan think they could destroy America? Would no, they, 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 they never they gonna, did. Did they think they were going to conquer the, Japan, the Western? Japan never did. Japan never. Japan. Japan never thought that they could destroy the United States of America. But Japan's whole goal wasn't to destroy the United States of America. The whole goal of Japan was to bring the United States of America into the World War conflict. And there were several reasons for that, by the way. There was a, 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 a terrible, terrible misnomer that existed amongst the Japanese, at least those that were that were the uh, yeah. in authority, right? That they could develop some kind of a 
uh, a military industrial complex that would improve the economic conditions of the country and create a new footing for something that they were trying to do on a completely different level that had nothing to do with the United States of America. So, so basically what Japan was saying, I'm going to attack America. I'm going to make sure that they don't have the ability to oppose what we want to do, and then we'll continue to do what we do in, in, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, to a degree. I also think that there was, there was probably some encouragement by... Uh, clandestine operators yep. that that exists. Is that what Iran is saying? I'm going to attack Israel and make sure that they do not have the ability to stop us from continuing our expansion, probably not into Europe right now, but into the rest of the Middle I, East. I, no, I think there's two, two major things that they're doing by what they are doing, okay? The first thing is they're trying to slow roll it, okay? They're, they're trying to drain Israel of their resources to be able to defend themselves uh, with the assets that they have by constantly sending things out that are easily defendable so that when the right time does come, they'll be able to send out assets that can't be defended from. Number one, that's what they're thinking is, right? Number two, and I think more significantly than all the other uh, types of thoughts, is they are looking to create the what I would call the perfect storm combination. They want to create a world of people who share the same disdain for Israel for different reasons, but the same disdain for Israel so that they can, uh, in essence, share the common that exists within the media to be able to encourage uh, nefarious action, okay? The second thing that they're wanting to do, and I think this is probably more significant or, or related to the second aspect of, of what they're looking to do, is they're looking to create a condition that starts a maximum effect for what it is that they're actually pursuing. They do mean it when they say death to America. They do mean it when they say death to Israel. And that's not even a question in their mind. They they mean it. They are serious. This is not something for them that's like, oh, well, I have a philosophy that, you know, life might be better if we get rid of these people. No, they're, it's like Allah tells them. They, they, they are, they believe it from the bottom of their heart that this is their call. This is why they're in, they live in life is to destroy these people, right? And so it, 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 they're going to do whatever it takes to get there. And remember, we all know this term. We've all talked about this term, takia. Uh, okay, we all know so, how, how de deception goes. So, in so well. tie this attack into us. I mean, 500 rockets, 500 munitions. They must have known that the vast majority of them are not going to get through. Where, where is this going? Drain the resources. It's 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 drain the resources. Well, here's the thing. I take think away the political. Take away the political prowess. Take away the the the, the political uh, uh, um, uh, the political capital, right? The 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 political currency that Israel has. The window for exactly. think about it like this. Okay. During during October seventh, Israel had I would venture to say probably about a forty eight to maybe forty eight hour to maybe one week window to just completely obliterate. They could have gotten away with obliterating Gaza. They had that window. I'd probably say 48 hours. Had they done it in 48 hours, which is militaristically impossible, right? Especially when you're doing it surgically like they were doing it. They had about a 48-hour window to do so. After that, then all you have to do is just watch the time clock. So so I'm, I'm going to put it, and maybe maybe this is a term. I don't know if this kind of fits it. But I think what Iran is doing is, is a Pavlovian effect. Yes. It's a, it's exactly right. It's a slow roll, 100%. It's, it's like this, okay? Okay. Um, we want, we can't take on Israel. We can't allow ourselves to uh, to a head-on confrontation with Israel. In fact, we can't even take on the West. But the West has reached a point where it's not going to stand up to us if we don't push it too hard. I mean, if we blow up a nuclear bomb in, in downtown Washington, okay, that's going to happen. But we are going to get the West used to uh, the fact that we're going to attack, but they're not going to do anything. And we're going to attack, and they're not going to do anything. And if they want to do something, we're going to have elements in us who are going to say, wait a minute, it's not worth the effort. They only cut off a finger. I mean, why go to a full-off war? Because you can live without a finger. And and this is a, 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 how to say, a dynamic of let's get the West used to being attacked yep. and not reacting. Yep, 100%. And I think that's what we saw on this attack that we just now did. And I think the world is reacting accordingly. I yeah. mean, the oh, yeah. fact October 7th did it, Habibi. October 7th did exactly that. The whole goal, we talked about it. You said it. You were the one that brilliantly said it. I just coined it. I took it and I repeated what you said uh, many, many times. But you said it, I think, on October 8th. It may have been on October 9th. In a private conversation we had, and you've said it online many, many times. You're saying, the only thing Hamas needs to declare victory 
is for nothing to happen to them for a certain period of time. Yep. And and that's that's exactly what's going on. That's exactly so, so, what's going so, on. So we're back to this. And and again, maybe maybe I'm going to go a little bit further with this. Christy, your last name is Tall, not Leonard. <laughs> Look at the super chat that she gave us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. We love you. David, your wife just super chatted us. Uh, well, I mean, you know, that's... It's her that's, old account. It has to be like her it, old It's got to be, but I, I like the fact that she's putting money into the the, the dynamic here. It's okay. We'll get some back to you, Chrissy. Don't <laughs> you worry. Brat. We love you. We'll totally we gotta, take we care of you, sweetheart. You. But uh, he, here's something that I... I, I oh, Christy, you, you took my line of thought. Okay. <laughs> no, no. But it's... Uh, oh, oh, I'm, thinking, here's the I'm thinking about process. dinner. They need time. They, they, they need time to be able to have victory. Here, here's my line of thought. Okay. And, and anybody who's ever gone down this route knows it. You don't fall into sin by going off and, and, and doing the ultimate sin. Sin comes into our lives in pieces. Yes. And, and, and if we sin a little bit and our conscience doesn't react, then, then the devil says, okay, we've got you used to this. Let's do a little bit more, okay? Let's just do this. And, and when you get used to that and we see that you're not reacting, we're going to push the boundary a little bit yep. more. And then you don't react to that. But I'm not going to start off with an all-out let's pull off the greatest sin and end it. Let's do a little sin. And then if, if, if you, when you get used to that, we'll go a little bit further. We'll, we'll enlo- and that's what I think Iran is doing. Let's that's do right. a little piece. Let's get you used to not reacting. Let's get you used to not standing up to evil, and then we'll do a little bit more evil. And if you're used to that, then we'll push a little bit more. And, and just like anybody who's ever gone down this slippery slope, you have to understand that, that the enemy doesn't come in, in a one massive blow. That's right. That's right. And I think that's what we're seeing here more than anything. David, what this is, is in essence, this is the Overton window being pushed. That's exactly what this is. And the Overton window is not just being pushed by Iran. The Overton window is being pushed by Hamas. The, which, by the way, I'm going to make myself very, very clear. The political arm of Hamas, or what they call the political arm of Hamas, was created by Iran. I mean, I, like, I don't know. Actually, let me, not, let me back up. That's not true. The political arm of Hamas was actually created by Israel. Let's just be real about that, okay? I think Israel uh, did that for several reasons. It was a, 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 a counteraction to the problem that they were dealing with, especially with the function of Islamic Jihad, yeah, with totally. the Palestinians, and so on and so forth. But very quickly, that backfired, just like Al-Qaeda backfired with us in, in Afghanistan, because what in essence happened was the influence that we allowed to, to the influence of the Islamic Brotherhood that we, ha- that we allowed to have in uh, uh, in Gaza was severely underestimated yeah. because in Israel we didn't create the Israelis didn't create Hamas but the Israelis gave credit to the existence of Hamas by allowing them to function as a political arm which then created the problem that we had so, to this day it's one of the greatest regrets of Israel so again let's go back to what we're talking about uh, there's no such thing as a little sin yeah that's right yeah, I mean, and, and going back to that, that that's what I'm saying. They pushed it. The, the window got pushed. What's acceptable? What's acceptable? What's acceptable? What's acceptable? And now it's like, wait, hold on. Look, why do you think Hamas took t- took uh, 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 hostages? Yeah. They took hostages so that they can buy time. Exactly. By the way, just so you know, the hostage situation, they, they've turned down another hostage. I know. Hostage agreement. Like for the, like the fourth time in, in well, like three and a half we, weeks. We think that there's more going on here and, and, and pray for us again. Uh, I, I, I I shiver, my blood chills, but I think the situation with the ha- with the hostages is a lot different than what we think. But I, I, know. I, I think they're dead. I want to change. Okay, let's imagine for a minute that I am a Chinese politician, Chinese leader, trying to decide how to do this, and I'm watching this, and I'm going to say, wait a minute. I need to extend my influence into the South China Sea. I've got, I don't know if you know, the first ring of islands, you know, yep. the, the, the island, um, you know, the, the, the problem that China is having with, with projecting its, its influence to the West. I am a great civilization. I should be ruling the Pacific Ocean, mm-hmm. but I'm kind of hemmed in by, by what's going on in the grand. So I'm not going to go and conquer Taiwan. 
because I everybody knows that's what I want to do, and that's what I want to do. I'm not going to conquer Taiwan. I'm going to t- conquer two islands that are just north of Taiwan and put an anti-missile base. And, can I, and t- let's can say, I take it a step further than let, that? Let's see if the world wants to stand up to me for those little islands. And if I see that the world doesn't want to stand up for me to those little islands, I'm going to take a piece of northern Philippines. Yeah. And let's see now if the world, now the world is getting used to not standing up to me. And slowly, slowly, I can actually project into, uh, because if I conquer Taiwan, everybody's going to be against but me. You gave me. But you gave us a great illustration. You said this is what China will do in order to push the window for people to accept it. Well, guess what? Did you know that China's already done it? Which one? China, China actually did it a year and a half ago. Almost two. Actually, China did it almost two and a half years ago. You want to know what, what I'll, it's, it's, it's two words. Ready? Hong Kong. China did it with Hong Kong. Remember the agreement that existed between uh, the Brits and China and what happened with respect to the existence of Hong Kong and how it was supposed to be treated. If you want to understand the complexities of that, by the way, uh, I think probably one of the, the foremost authorities on this subject um, happens to be the, the president of Hillsdale College. He's probably the one that's good, that is like the foremost expert on this, on this subject with, 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 with uh, what happened with China and Hong Kong. I extensively researched this um, about a year ago for some videos that I had done back then. I've, oh my goodness, I spent hundreds of hours learning about what happened there. But everything that China did with Hong Kong was designed to push the Overton window with the international community to accept the premise of what they were going to do in Taiwan. And by the way, the international community swallowed it hook, line, and, and sinker, including the UK, because Boris Johnson was a complete donkey <laughs> in how he chose to handle that when the parliamentary structure that existed within Hong Kong was completely removed, or the influence of the parliamentary structure that existed in Hong Kong was completely removed, and China pretty much swallowed it all up. And they did it contrary to the agreement that existed between them it, it, there's so much to say about that by the way i'm, I'm over uh, simplifying the problem that happened yeah, there okay but they did exactly that it's called brinkmanship yeah it's it's, it's a it's a political kind of strategy if you want to put it that way or political or, or military strategy and i think our enemies are using it very well and here's the thing how do you stop it how do you deal with it okay and and i know this sounds weird and and again maybe i'm projecting what might happen but what you need to do is you got to go crazy. That's my point. You got to go crazy. You got you got to rip. You have to rip the scab right off, and you have to just go. And 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 basically, you have to say, okay, I did it. What now? Okay. So so here's the thing. Okay. And and, and maybe here's part of the problem. All right. Everybody's telling Israel, don't go crazy. But what I believe Israel should do right now is go crazy. Yeah. And and kind of deal with the repercussions. But again. I'm not the leadership, and I'm not going to be the one to make make the decisions, okay? But again, you see the difference between this administration in the United States and the former administration in the United States. I mean, a bit. Look, we've we've been there before. And I, I've been there. One of the things about your former president was, you know, besides all the rest of the stuff, nobody knew what he was really going to do. Yeah. Everybody was afraid. They he feared might him. Go crazy. They feared him. And as a result of that, he projected more power than this administration ever went because Biden says, "Don't." And they do. And they don't even care. No, no, let's take it a step further. Biden says don't, and then they do, and then Biden writes them a massive paycheck. Not only that, he holds us back from yeah. retaliating. Yeah. Okay, not only will he, the first thing he said is Israel, uh, America will not take part in any retaliation. And the second thing he says is we're going to try to hold Israel back as much as we can. See, and it, if it was me, and I know I'm oversimplifying it, then I would just tell America to go shove it up their rears. <laughs> That's exactly what I would say. I would say, you know what, Joe? Go shove it up your rear, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to retaliate, and when Iran comes back after out your bases that are in the region, you can fight for yourself. Okay, so so here's the question, and and, and part of my, my dilemma here is, okay, do we need the United States? No. And that's a bigger question. We don't. As Israel. Israel doesn't need the United States. Nope. Um, As a matter of fact, can I just tell you this right now? Yep. If Israel did not have the covering of the United States in the region, I would venture to say that all of the Middle Eastern countries that surrounded Israel would fear Israel a whole lot more. Okay. Because the one thing that the United States has been doing for Israel in the last 15 years, 20 years, longer than that, 30 or 40 years, 
has been holding Israel, telling Israel, stop, don't, 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 stop, don't, 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 stop, 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 stop. If if the United States of America basically washes its hands of Israel or Israel tells the United States of America to go shove off, I can tell you this right now. Uh, that but, same effect with Trump but, would happen with, with Israel. Okay. And thousands of movies have been made about this, and let's see if I can see if I can project. Why did Israel not flatten Gaza the day after the attack? We know why Israel didn't flatten Gaza, because if you if you stop for one moment to even consider one aspect of Israeli culture. Israeli culture is all about the preservation of life. Exactly. So what we're dealing with here is a classic Western style movie or whatever, gangster style movie. The bad people are willing to be bad. The good people need to be bad in order to defend themselves against the bad people. But you can't be willing to be bad and still remain a good person. And, and here is the classic dilemma of morality that the Bible has talked about again and again and again. Okay, how do we defend ourselves against the evil in the world without becoming evil in but, ourselves? You see, but that's the problem with the morality that exists, and okay. especially, and you just did me a favor. I'm going to put you on the spot here. <laughs> you did me a favor, and you actively demonstrated to, to, to the world right now the, the, the mindset of your people. The mindset of Israel, and that is a mindset that was created as a result of a departure from the God of your fathers. And the mindset is this, and and you 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 you, you it. say it because it's subtle, but you you're not you're not catching it. And I guarantee you the moment I say it, it's going to turn on a light in your head. Right? You're 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 saying you have to become evil in order to overcome evil. My statement, the the biblical statement is. Your aggression does not amount to evil if that aggression is founded in the necessity of preservation I got you. for the country that God established. As a matter of fact, let me take it a step further. When you look at the biblical model, what God through the prophets actually called evil is when Israel did not finish the job that God told them to finish. When we look at the story of the Amalekites, the condemnation was not the attack on Amalek. The condemnation was the fact that they didn't finish the job. They didn't do what they did. So the 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 idea behind any retaliation, or let's forget the word retaliation. Let's throw the word retaliation away. Let's just say you did something as a result of an anticipatory function. Let's let's just say you did something in 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 the interest of preventing an attack, and it was viewed as an act of aggression. In, in many cases, you can make an argument that that was actually an action of righteousness and not evil. So the mindset is in Israel, and this is this, it's, a, it's a problem. It's a problem. As a matter of fact, this was part of an offline conversation I had with somebody extremely close. And when I say extremely, probably one of the closest men to the prime minister. I had this conversation offline with him, Okay. The biggest problem that exists right now in Israel with respect to the aggression of the military centers around the thought process or the idea that any aggression on any level is going to be viewed or understood as evil. When in reality, that aggression may actually be an action of righteousness because of what it does for the people involved as a result uh, that, that come from the reciprocal of that action. Again, again, all this is a result, and Israel is, I think, less than the United States. All this is a result of us decomposing the difference between right and wrong, 100%. between evil and, and godliness. 100%. Okay, and when everything becomes relative, then there is a problem. But I will say this: there are still things that are evil. Okay, and as somebody who has seen combat and has had civilians in my scope. When I have to decide when to fire, you still want to have, and I'm I'm going to say this with with from the bottom of my heart, I still want to have a sensitivity. I will make a decision based on the situation, but I do want to have a sensitivity to the sanctity of of life, even but, in that but kind Habibi, of situation. Habibi, I'm just telling you this, and and I don't mind having this conversation online. There's a massive difference between what you are calling a, the sanctity of life and the necessity to act for the sake of the preservation of your nation. Here's the problem. 
where the look war in and of itself on any level is evil. Okay, it's a function of the unrighteousness let, of let, man and the rebellion against there. man. And so, when you choose to retaliate, you're the tank commander, and and you have to push the button. And uh, you know you're going to take innocent life, but you have to do it in order to destroy an enemy position. There's no way that you cannot say that that is the result of an evil condition in an evil world. I agree. But the action of you having to do that is not considered evil. It's the result of the initiation of evil by your enemy. I agree. Okay. But as somebody who's been there. And I might push the button. I might pull the trigger. I've been in places where I did pull the trigger. I agree. I don't want to lose of course. that sensitivity. Amen. Amen. Even if I, after weighing the situation, decide that I do have to push that button, okay, I don't want it to be out of, and here's what my enemy says, okay? Your life does not mean anything to me. Right. Okay? I'm not saying to my enemy, your life doesn't mean anything. I'm saying to my enemy, your life means something. My life means more, but your life still means something to me. Amen. And I don't want to lose that sensitivity. Israel did not turn uh, Gaza into a parking lot because we want to have that sensitivity, and we will, and to a certain extent, even put our own life in jeopardy in order to not lose that sensitivity yeah, completely. Yeah. But I can promise you this. Like I, I, I like I can I can make you this promise and I can do it on your behalf. I <laughs> I because I already know if if a man comes into your home with nefarious intent mm -hmm. while you're in, in bed tonight, that man isn't going to survive. That man's not going to walk out of the house alive. He's just not. Oh, if if a, if a man get a nine millimeter greeting, yeah. If a man, if a man, that's small to me. But if a man walks into my home, it's enough. And he comes after my children. I promise you, he's not surviving. He's not going to walk out of my home alive. And you know what? I'll have lunch five minutes later. I won't even blink about it. Now, don't get me wrong. Am I going to be devastated for the rest of my life? About the idea that I took a human life, darn straight. I oh. will never be the same oh, as a me. result of taking a human life. You've heard me say this before. It makes a scratch on yeah, your soul. It, 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 it wrecks you. And I know that because as a pastor, I have counseled hundreds of people that have taken lots of lives. As a matter of fact, um, I recently, not recently, about 10 years ago, I had to sit down with a young kid who was a drone operator. You know, he's sitting in a in a in a little room uh, somewhere in the United States of America. I can't really talk about, and he's got a joystick, and it's like it feels like a video game to him until one day he pulls the trigger and he takes the lives of two hundred enemy combatants, and th and now in his mind he's like, it's not just two hundred people that that died. He like years later he's thinking about family and children and don't have a dad. And, I mean, I, know, I went through that experience at the age of nineteen. Oh, hundred percent. Hundred percent. I know. I know what it's like. Hundred percent. But again, I'm I'm happy or glad or or really important for me not to lose that sensitivity, which means, even now, well, the government of Israel is deciding how to retaliate. There is going to be a sensitivity to Iranian lives that will be taking of in course. any kind of retaliation. And you and I both know, like when we start talking about the Persian people, th there are some of the most amazing people in the world that I've met are Persians. People who, who left Iran because of the condition, you know, around the time of the Shah. And, and I mean, there's a lot of really wonderful people. The Iranian people are, are of great concern to me, of course. But the reality of it is they have a wicked government and their decision is going to bring destruction upon their people. Okay. And again, wickedness sometimes takes root in good soil. Is of that, course. Is that a way to say it? No, that's absolutely know. right. Okay. 100%. Which is why we have to be careful. We have to be sensitive. We have to be vigilant that the soil that we're standing in does not accept wickedness. And maybe this is a lesson because if we let the enemy get used to us accepting evil with quietness, then the more we do that, the more the wickedness will seep into the soil that we're standing in. Hundred percent. And I think it's that's not even a question. That's part of the story. So let's see what's going to happen with Israel now. By the way, uh, we haven't talked about the possibilities, but what do you think about a cyber attack? I think they're already happening. Quite frankly, I think I think Israel has mastered that aspect with uh, with Iran. As a matter of fact, that's really interesting. I can't get into a lot of details uh, with this. Um, but one of the um, 
No, I, ugh, I got to be really careful how I say this. I, let me let me think about how I how I say this. Um, I, I have a a. Uh, I'm just going to say this. I I have always in the Since last. When are you careful about what? No, you No, this I have to. You'll understand why I have to be careful when I say this. Um, I I have uh always been known for years and years and years and years and years and years, and years uh, to have an affiliation with uh. Law enforcement and other organizations that deal with uh, the, uh, the the aspect cyber of world. cyber world, military, um, uh, all of that. Um, the, okay, it, the only thing that I can tell you is this. <laughs> I'll just I'll just say this: um, Israel has become a literal master at resetting the capacity of Iran using cyber tools. Mm-hmm. It almost seems like, right, like uh, 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 it's almost as though there are people from within the inside of Iran who are helping that, Israel. That not only are helping Israel, but understand when the reset time needs to come. And um, uh, this I can say, I, I can make a general statement. I can make a really general statement. Um, we were the first to deploy a certain type of technology uh, when I was a, a, the chief information officer of a local municipal police department. And our closest and most significant neighbor was an Israeli technology company mm -hmm. that is at the forefront of all of this with the IDF. So um, uh, le let me just say that uh, this has been a longstanding thing. And Iran is not going to outwit Israel when it comes to the cyber stuff. Well, here's the problem. Should Israel use its cyber ability? Yes, they already do. Yes, and that's but all I'm going to say. I'm, I'm saying here in this event. Yes. Okay, because what happens? Yes. Cyber abilities basically are something that are done under the mattress, under yep. the under the rug. Okay, um, Israel needs something that's being done above the mattress, above the rug. I mean, again, we know about uh, the 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 viruses. Uh, we know we know all about kosher viruses. Okay. And it, we do separate our meat virus from our from our dairy uh, virus. I, I, and I'll everything. say this. Come on, that was a joke. There, I know, I know, but I, I. But can I just say this because it's not too far from reality. <laughs> it's not. It's not too far from reality. Okay. That. It, well, let me say this. This is the reason why I wasn't laughing. I thought you were actually serious. Um, there is technology out there right now that can mm -hmm. create food illness. Yeah. Okay. Based on the understanding that there are a. Uh, a series of computer systems that maintain the safety of food that's stored, okay? Or water. Or water. So we. So that's that's why I wasn't laughing because I'm like, oh, I thought, wow, I can't believe he's talking about that. But uh, there's there's a bigger issue here. There's a there's a there's a there's a much bigger picture, right? And that is a fact. Um, I'm I'm still trying to think of how I can say this. Um, oh, okay, here here this is a this is a hypothetical. This is theoretical. This is a this is hypothetical. Israel, or a country like Israel, that has advanced technology, right, hypothetically could have the capacity to create explosions in nuclear facilities that, that provide energy mm. or have the ability technically to shut down power grids. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's possible. It's theoretically possible, even when you have self contained systems that are not con that are not connected to networks. Nope. Yep. I think that's the that's the most I can say without getting in trouble, or getting anybody else in trouble. Okay. But 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 it's it yeah it's right. not it's not so it's not far from Israel to utilize something like that and be very open about it. All right. So no, the problem is this: should we use that capacity in this system? Undoubtedly. No. Do you think a cyber attack now would be a good way for Israel to react to what happened? I think it's a very small part of what should be a much larger way to react. Mm -hmm. I think it should be a compilation of proxies? a series of things. Should we be attacking proxies or attack Iran directly? I think you attack Iran directly and let the proxies sit in fear. So what would you think if a port on the, Red, on the Persian Gulf all of a sudden disappears? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, 100%. It would be smart. See, if you guys, okay, so uh, the audience that's watching right now, um, there are very few people that will know the reference that David is making right now. If you if you knew what he was talking about, you would realize how flippin' brilliant the man is. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs>
You're so freaking smart. Yeah, but but, it's, here's, it's, it's, but, yeah. but here's the thing. This is what your government. Notice is how he's about. moving to a different direction now. <laughs> he's not talking about it anymore. Uh, but this is what your government is worried about. I mean, the last thing Biden needs right now is for proof for fuel prices to go up. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. the, or for for inflation to, to go yeah. up. Yep. So everybody is saying to Israel, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't do anything that will impact yeah. our way of life. But Habibi, the problem is, is no matter how you cut it, the Red Sea and the Suez Canal is already affected. Oh, no. You're, you're, and, and, the, and, and there's people that are talking about an alternate path from the Persian Gulf to go down into the Indian Ocean yeah, and it's, around, it's not going to work. It's not there yet. And the Straits of no. Hormuz are more important than the, the, the 100%. Bab al Mandeb. So, 100%. So here, here we are in this, this catch-22 situation. And again, this is what allows the enemy to have more power, more weight, more influence, more danger than, uh, than in the past. Because if you suffer the consequence of create, is why you mentioned the port. And I was like, oh boy, uh, if you if you suffer the consequence that comes from the disruption in the exporting of goods, uh, specifically through the Mediterranean, because it's all going to come through the Suez, right? Uh, or or for uh, uh, you know we talk about the Hormuz Strait or any of these other areas, right? You immediately create a much more significant problem. And that significant problem is um, you almost completely put the whole world at the mercy of Asia. It's what you do. Um, Specifically China. In the short term, yes. Yeah, but, in, uh, but in, short in term is term. all you need, Habibi. Yeah, well, well, here's the thing. The question is, again, when will this come down? And again, this is all tying together to something bigger. And and the only reason China has the 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 um, the influence it has is because the United States of America is not manufacturing anything inside the states anymore. Yeah, but by the way, you know there would be an exception to this rule. Okay, where that port could be gone and all kinds of other things could be affected, and it would be no problem. It'd be without any consequence. Like it would literally be like I didn't even blink. As a matter of fact, it would be cheaper, much more efficient, and it would actually be better for these economies, especially the economy of the West. Even if you completely blew up the Red Sea and you had nothing in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf was gone, if Saudi Arabia signs normalization with Israel, mm -hmm. you, the problem is done. Solved. Yeah. Gun. You don't need the Straits of Hormuz and you don't need the nope. Bab al Mandeb. Nope. And, and Egypt would still not mind that because Egypt knows that it has on the table for it a, a, a significant amount of subsidy that would come from Saudi Arabia as a result of the disabling of the Suez. The, it, it's already been talked about. MBS has been talking about it. So uh, Egypt wouldn't even object to that. As a matter of fact, Egypt might assist in the effort because you know what becomes a beneficiary of that as well and actually could probably produce more it revenue than uh, than the Suez. And people call me crazy when I say this. Sharm el Sheikh. Yeah. The Sinai. So let's say we solve the, the Suez Canal problem. And then we solved the Panama Canal problem. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> sorry, that's way, a much more difficult no, problem no, to solve. No, Mexico is putting something together right now. What does that mean, David? Okay, because uh, I, I'm uh, like that. I can't conceive of a way that Mexico solves the Suez Canal problem. Well, I mean, there the, is uh, the there Panama is a, there problem. is a project in southern Mexico which is basically um, massive um, cargo terminals on both sides. So a land on, bridge and and uh, trains. Okay, and hmm. if you do it big enough and fast enough and wide enough, maybe. I don't know. But how do you do it without, ex like, extraordinarily raising the cost of shipping? No, you won't close the Panama Canal. But there is there is a competition to the Panama Canal coming on. And again, and, and, and what, what I'm trying to say is this. Okay, maybe maybe mm, we're, going, we're going above the, the Goodyear blimp. Yeah, but that's a rabbit trail that's interesting. Like, I would we're be interested above, to go search ag it. Above the Goodyear blimp, we're in satellite mode right now. Where the commercialism becomes more important than the personal safety. 100%. Okay. Meaning uh, the ability of me to receive, for me to receive goods safely, uh, quickly, cheaply from Amazon is more important than the threat to my life. It's true. And, and this is to a certain extent where we're going. Okay. And, and this is a much, much bigger story. And you can go down that. Oh, wherever you want. Okay, so so um, I know you kept saying that you were going to get there, right? So let's do this, okay? 
Uh, what happens next? What's Israel going to do? <clears throat> I think Israel is going to pull off a, a, a strategic attack, and and I, I'm I'm. What does that mean, Habibi? What's a strategic? Israel is going to say to Iran, "This we are going to blow up this facility at five o'clock, and if you you don't, and 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 do it." Will Israel warn Iran? Israel does doesn't Israel, want does Israel have Israel, the, does, Israel doesn't want a war with Iran right now. We need to do this, but just like we need to do this without Iran turning this into a Iran Israel war. Okay. Uh quick question. Who's the biggest military in the Middle East right now? Probably Iran, right? Probably. I'm kind of asking myself, wait a minute, Pakistan? Yeah, but I wouldn't consider Pakistan Middle East. Okay. I mean, we're technically in the in the ten forty window. If you had to count Pakistan, Pakistan, Iran, hands Iran, down. Iran, is them the and in, between them and India, they're the they're Iran the, is. Yeah. I think I think it's the thirty sixth most populous country in the world. I think it's got an economy that's bigger than Egypt, easily. Um, yeah, so, easily. Yeah. Iran, Turkey, most no, but still, I mean, Turkey's not Middle East. Yeah, I, I call Turkey Asia Minor. I mean, technically, you know, technically Israel's Asia Minor, but. We still call Israel Middle East just because of the connections. What would happen if Turkey and Iran got together? Turkey and Iran are together. Yeah, but really got together. Mm, I don't think they'd do it without a unifying source. <coughs> they have to have a unifying source. And the problem is, is it would be Russia. That's Ezekiel 38. It would be. But the problem is, is that you're not going to get that with Turkey right now because Erdogan is so preoccupied with the idea that he's rebuilding the, Erdogan, uh, the, rebuilding the Ottoman Empire. That's what he thinks he's doing. So there's so no way he's going to Erdogan rebuild. Erdogan is rebuilding the Ottoman Empire. Iran is rebuilding the uh, Persian Empire. That's right. Russia Iraq is rebuilding the Russian yeah, Empire. Yeah, yeah, And Iraq is is definitely, definitely rebuilding the Babylonian <laughs> Empire. Okay. That is for sure. Okay. And Babylon is the one that's got the greatest chance of sticking around. You know, you know what I feel like? In the old city, when you go on, there's a T-shirt that says, <laughs> how many people have attacked Israel? How many empires has Israel survived? Oh, yeah. We've already survived the Persian Empire. We've already survived an Ottoman Turkish Empire. We've already survived an Egyptian Empire. Babylon, <laughs> the Medo-Persian <laughs> Uh, the Medes, the and, Grecian. And in this tiny little nation that God has put his hand on, and again, I mean, if you go back to what, tiny little nation that God has put his hand on is watching all of these empires kind of bounce around and joss around for themselves. 100%. And, and, and we're still here. Yep. And I think that is more than anything a proof of it God's is, providence. It is unbelievably remarkable to to uh, consider for even one minute how much God's providence has shown uh, in 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 so many ways. I mean, it is it is remarkable to understand that God has preserved His people, which is like, why aren't we learning that lesson? Like, why aren't people why aren't people recognizing that you're not going to beat Israel? It's just it's just not going to happen. Yeah, but again, and and maybe uh, I think my wife is listening to me, so this is going to kind of get to us. This conversation that we're having um you know people look at us and say i mean isn't it cool to be jewish isn't it cool to be god's chosen people isn't it cool to be you know uh uh the, the apple of god's eye yep. and then i'm saying wait a minute do you remember what we celebrate every holiday yep. we celebrate people who try to kill us yep and and you know let me let me make this clear okay my family is in israel i mean again here we go here we go again People are going to try to kill us again. I mean, I, I, it's like I'm used to it. But for people who are not used to it, think about living in that kind of situation. Bro, I, I'll tell you a funny story. When I first married my wife, um, I, I was in a situation with her where um, I found myself complaining a little bit. And what I was complaining about was... Um, and this was when I was on the radio and I wasn't, I mean, I'm still on the radio. I'm we're on way more radio stations than we were back then. Uh, but, um, we weren't on YouTube. That's what I mean to say. And, um, I was complaining to my wife about how frustrating it is that anywhere I go, people just want to stop me and talk to me. <laughs> and, and I just want to have days where I'm alone. Like I just like, just I love you, and anytime I see somebody, I'm always going to go, God bless you and thank you. And I rule, I always mean that from the bottom of my heart. Like, I love people, right? But then when I get, like, 
if you know that I'm doing something that is clearly like I'm, I'm having a moment, like give me the moment, right? Uh, you know, you just give me the moment. So um, my wife implies that I'm being ungrateful. Mm. Like she's not saying it because my wife would never do that. Like my wife is such an amazing woman, you know, and she's my biggest supporter, right? Um, but she she kind of implied like, come on, James, have a better attitude about this, right? Okay. So I, I told her, I said, um, wait till we're married. We'll spend, we'll spend some time together. We'll figure this out, right? I, this is what I used to tell her. So um, it was one of my favorite moments of us being married together in terms of like a, oh, James, you were right moment. You know what I mean? My wife and I go to an Applebee's that is like in Norwalk or something like that. I mean, it, uh, not near here, Signal Hill. And we sit down and we start having a meal. And a guy, it's no joke, a guy sees us, right? Sees me. He hears my voice because he doesn't know mm -hmm. my, my, my face, you know? And he says, I can't believe that I'm talking to Pastor James right now. <laughs> and I kid you not, it took everything within me not to like knock his block off <laughs> because he almost pushed my wife to the side. Yeah. And sat down in the bench across the way to me, like in the booth, and just started talking. And I'm like, I, in your space, in oh, your time, man, in your everything. I, I love you, but I just want to have a moment with my wife. And actually, I I I believe that it was a, a birthday event <laughs> or something like that that we were just having together. And, and my point is, is like, I love the people that I see. Like, I love nothing more than people when they stop me and go, hi, Pastor James. I get to hug them. I get to take a picture with them. I get to tell them, thank you for watching. Like, I love it when people approach me. I just really, really do. I mean, I think it's really sweet. And I think it's really special. Um, but there are times where you just realize, oh, this is this is too much. It's the, it's very similar with, with being a Jew. Does she understand it now? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. My wife very my wife understands it so, more than so anybody I'm, that I know. I'm going to use this platform, and I'm going to say, uh, me and Christy are heading off to Israel in a week and a bit. Yeah, she's about to understand it, bro. And and she's I think and and I'm understanding her understanding much much better as a result of everything that we're going through. And uh, what I need you to do is, I mean, you know, besides the obvious, and and the, just pray for us that that this will be a good trip. Yeah, you'll have one more show here before you go to Israel? Yep. Okay. We'll definitely be praying for you. And you're going to be there for about a month? A month and a half. A month and a half. Yeah. Okay. And we'll see what's going to happen. Well, we'll still have you do these shows. You just call I, in. I will. We'll do I them will. live. We, we, can do them, we can do them live. Um, though I will say that with everything that I understand and I know, I, I really respect her much, much more. She is totally doing the Ruth thing. And and we oh, read bro, about some, it. Look. We read about it in the Bible, and and you you know you do the lessons, but it's only when you when you see people actually do it do you really appreciate it. Look, I just put something out, and it might it might make a few people mad. Like it might ruffle some feathers, right? Uh -oh. Like because uh, like I I, I you love ruffling I've been feathers. I've been close to your in law family <laughs> for longer than you've even been around. Uh, mm -hmm. Like Christy, I mean, I have a thirty year history with Christy, right? Like I I knew her thirty years ago. Um, and, and I'll just say this. I don't, I don't care. Say I'll say it in the public. I just don't really care. Um, the Johnsons have always produced very talented people, right? Mm -hmm. Tara's talented. Uh, Linda's talented. Even Jeffrey. Like if I, I, I got to spend a month with Jeffrey and Jeffrey's a smart, really talented guy. So, you know, you just look at all of the, all of the children of uh, Pastor Jeff, but um and and everybody has been somewhat public in one way or another during times. Tara was for a period she was singing a lot and she mm -hmm. was talking to people and sharing with people. And you know, you had different you had different people. But you know the real smart one in the whole group? Like the one who can who's who's a better speaker. I know. The one who's a I smarter know. person. Believe me, I know. And and the one who actually gets it more than any of the other children. Like like not even it's like night and day. Like and no, I mean look. Tara, they're all wonderful people. They're all very smart. Believe me, they're I all know. gifted, right? I know where you're going with this, and I know. Christy, hands down. You know the one who realizes it the least? Mm. Christy. <laughs> it's the truth. Well, I'm I'm saying it from here. You're amazing. Yeah. She's yeah. And she's a good speaker. Oh, yeah. Oh, she's a great yeah. communicator. And she's not stupid. What do we want to talk about next week, Jen? 
Uh, bro, I think <laughs> let me just tell you about next week. Let me just tell you what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, we what don't have to worry week? about. We're, yeah, we're not going to have to worry about what to talk about next week because next week we'll be talking about a lot. As yeah. a matter of fact, next week I think will probably be a crazier show than this week because I think that we, we're going to be dealing with um, some crazy stuff. Where, where do you think we're going? In let, let, can I ask you this before we kind of wrap it up? Where do you think we're going? in uh in a week from now but by the time we get to today next well by the time we get to tuesday of next week what do you think israel will have will have already done well there's one thing i want to put here i mean everybody's talking about the iran thing we still have hostages in gaza it's not over it is not over <clears throat> and it has to be dealt with so so and 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 i think that's going to come to some kind of kind of um so I, Do you think Israel will go into Rafa before they retaliate against uh, Iran? I am. Think they'll do I, it simultaneously? Wait a minute. I, I am praying, and and again, according to some of the the the, um, the rumors that I heard coming out, okay, Hamas is trying to get off the tree quietly, and uh, there's a serious problem. But they're trying they're trying to keep the hostage negotiation going. They're trying to hold it together. They have realized that Israel has gone more crazy than they thought they would. And they're at a point where they're trying. And Israel is saying, may, may, okay, if you're willing to get off the tree, let's see if we can find a way for you to do it. Um, Iran is trying to get off the tree quietly. So, so there's going to be two dynamics that are going on. It's going to be a, you know, kind of get off the tree, kind of, all right, well, let's, you know, do something like this. But they have to hit Rafa. So does Israel hit Rafa before? <clears throat> what happens? What happens if Hamas agrees to return hostages and to leave Gaza? They they'll get they'll get their hostages, and they still have to deal with Rafa. I think what's going to happen is Hamas is going to come out with something that says, "If you can live with this, we will call it quits." And then the question is, will Israel accept that? And that's going to be, I mean, this is a, how do you say, this is a, a wet soap kind of situation. Do you squeeze or do you, do you, do you let it go? And, you put and, it on the ground and you light a flamethrower. <laughs> you wish, melt it. I wish. But uh, we'll see. And, and I think this week is going to bring in a lot of, this week is going to bring a lot of um, interesting aspects. And uh, come on. We were sitting here a week ago, and if I'd have told you that Iran would have fired 500 munitions at Israel, you would have said no. Or directly from oh, Iran. Oh, no way. I would have directly completely from. said no way, not in a million years. I bet my directly life Directly from Iranian I, I, soil? I We talked about it. Last yeah. week, I said, totally. I guarantee you we're going to see Iranian proxies aggressively attack we Israel. We all thought. The, uh, Hezbollah. Guaranteed, we were going to see action from Hezbollah so, in the so north, in the so Golan here Heights, in Syria. So we're here. We are sitting a week later, yep. and they, they fired five hundred munitions at Israel, and we're saying, "Wait, Israel will, Israel won't," and the world is expecting Israel not to. No, Israel has again, to. again, again. We're going back into this appeasement. Let's 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 do a little bit of evil, and then see if you can live with that. And I mean, El Quds was getting ready to 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 uh, to plan an attack. And and here's the enemy saying, "Oh, we're the victim." I yeah. mean, the guy that planned the the seventh of October attack is saying, "I'm the victim." Okay. And and the highest ranking member of the IRGC, who's an El Quds terrorist, is working hand in hand with Hamas and Hezbollah to train their operatives <laughs> to attack Israel. And all of a sudden, we expect Israel to not say anything. Yeah. Well, well, here's the thing: America took out Soleimani, and 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 bragged about it, and bragged about it, and the world didn't blink. Why all of a sudden is Israel taking out this guy, and the world's going all crazy at us, and accepting the fact that Iran is okay with retaliating? What would happen if Iran retaliated against the United States for taking out Soleimani? With this, with well, with Trump. Iran would have been carpet bombed. There's a difference, and it, it, hallelujah, it, we got to the thing. Guys, you know what to do. Yeah, I mean, he, it would have been carpet bombed. It would have been completely carpet bombed. Iran Iran wouldn't even be a country. It would be just completely blitzed to the ground. I don't know. Okay, let's say Iran fires 20 ballistic missiles at downtown USA. What would the Americans do? With uh, Biden? America would pay Iran. 
<laughs> I'm not kidding you. We would go there. We'd say, here, you know what? Here's $300 billion. Please don't do that again. So here, here's a situation where, and, and this is going to be a very interesting week. Pray for us. Pray for us. Yeah, there's a lot to pray for. There's there's definitely a lot to pray for. There's there's a lot. Um, do you think anything actionable is happening within the week? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're if, gonna if, sit, based on we're your gonna background and expertise, week. based on your background and expertise, what what's going to happen? Can I tell you what I think is going to happen? Yeah, go for it. Okay. I think they have to go into Rafa. It, like you said, if some agreement doesn't isn't come to, I think this week they're going into Rafa. And I think not only they're going oh, into Rafa. Oh, by the way, Israel s- stated officially that we did not go into Rafa because of this attack. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's they 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 were preparing. As a matter of fact, I had a video that I played mm-hmm. of Netanyahu talking about that with some yep. officials at uh, one of the Air Force bases. Yep. Uh, okay, so th- um, uh, I think they're going to go into Rafa. They, I think they they have to. Uh, and I think while that happens, they're going to uh, respond to Iran. I think it, I think they're going to happen simultaneously. Oh, that's going to be interesting. Yeah, I think it's the smartest thing to do if they're going to do that. I think it's the smartest thing to do because it's going to take eyes off of what's going on in Gaza. Here we go. And it's going to surprise Hamas. That that's what I think. But now, what do you think? You tell me. What what do you? I mean, your 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 insight's going to be way better than mine because obviously. You know, you were doing military. The only uh, thing before I'm, I'm kind of, kind of. What did you start in the military? 1981. Oh, 1981. Okay, so, so I was five years old. January 1981, they put army boots on me. I was five years old <laughs> when you were doing. So, so you're gonna know way more than me about what they. Well, what well, they were I'm not sure, but here's the thing. I, I'm kind of curious, and and here's something that might it might be a cyber attack, and Israel's gonna say, we're gonna close off. Your electricity in Tehran for two hours, and they might kind of finish with that. You think so? Something as dumb as I'm going to cut your electricity for eh, two hours. Well, no, probably more than electricity, but yeah, something as a cyber attack that says, "Here, this is what we can do to you if you do this." I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if if something like that happened, mm. and that way we appease the world. And appease this. I mean, cut off their electricity for two weeks. Now now we're talking. Okay. Or maybe something like that, yeah. Wow. So you think it's going to be a cyber and that's it? No. Um, I'm worried about the the political situation is going to push into something that we're going to say we did it without actually doing it. So no explosives. Uh, Maybe. Maybe. Because can Israel afford to come off that week? Okay, what would scare Iran on that level as much as blowing up a, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, an oil facility in, uh, in the Persian, on the Persian Gulf? The assassination of a lot of its leaders. Direct assassination, meaning? Yeah, you have, I don't know if it's Mossad or whoever, you just go in there and just take well, a bunch of guys out. I, I don't think we can do that much. But let's say we target, let's say, the higher echelon of their missile yeah. defense system. I mean, in their homes, in their beds. You drop a rocket on every house where every one of them is sitting. Yep. By the way, we haven't talked about the Hania family, that kind of... Oh, talk about this. You, you, we should talk about this for just a second. Uh, 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 because I don't know if our audience understands that at all. Uh, talk about that, because that's that's very very important. Well, Ismail Ania is the head of the uh, or the political head of the Hamas, and he, it's and it's two children and three grandchildren. I think it was three children and four grandchildren. Oh, three and four. That's right, three and four. Yeah, if sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead, I, explain. Okay, so so um, Ismail Ania is the head of the Hamas. He he lives in in uh, Dubai, uh, no, in uh, uh, Qatar. Qatar. Okay. Uh, but uh, his sons were uh, taking out, taken out in, a, in an attack, an Israeli drone attack yeah. uh, in the vehicles, and three of his sons died in the attack together with, I think... Four I, grandchildren. Four yeah, grandchildren. I think that's right. Of, of Ismail Aniyah. Now, Israel is saying very truthfully, they were active members of Hamas. Yeah. Okay? They were actually military targets. Uh, the grandchildren are what you would call collateral damage, okay? And and here's the thing: the whole world kind of, eh, what are you doing? What, how are you doing this? But I mean, do you know what he said? Did you see his interview? Yes. Did you see what he said? And 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 he's calling them martyrs and yeah. heroes, and he's happy that they're dead. It's a death cult, and and here's something: there have been death cults in in the past, okay? 
um, different evilness has actually translated into cultures who, how do you say, um, turn death into a, a, a reward. A literal okay. game. A literal, a literal game. It is so against everything that, that the Bible says. It's 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 demonic, it's the devil. Yeah, it's the devil. Here we go. <sighs> oh, we're gonna have an interesting week, ladies and gentlemen. We will have an interesting week, and and kind of let's. I, I'm curious to see and and kind of worried. So pray for Israel. Pray for us. Yeah. Pray for our leadership. Pray for your leadership that kind of finds a backbone in some way, shape, or form. Hey, man, <laughs> that, that, if our leadership finds a backbone in one, in one, you know, shape or form with respect to Israel, it will literally be God just completely moving their brains what? and changing their minds because the likelihood that that's going to happen is impossible. Well, I'm, I'm always reminded of the story of Noah when, uh, of Jonah, when Jonah came to the, the Assyrians and he said, and they did, they did repent and they put on sack and they, they repented and, and they were saved. And, and again, I don't know. I mean, who am I to say what God can or cannot yeah, do? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Habibi. I mean, uh, and God, and, and it's true. God can do anything. Let me do this. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of these super chats and then we're going to end our live show and go to locals and take a few questions. Yep. Will be available to that. By the way, that will be for members only. Uh, you guys are awesome. Uh, if it, it, the the support you guys show us is is such a blessing, and we're going to give you guys a little bit of time and take some questions. So um, we are we're just so thankful for the support that you guys give us. Let me uh, read some of these uh, super chats that came in uh, very quickly. N Nicole W B, you say, what is the likelihood of a uh, uh, oh, we talked about this already. Instead of a kinetic attack, a virus instead of a kinetic attack. Yeah, we already talked about that. It's a great question, by the way. Um, Bart John, you say Bidenish means <laughs> Biden, Biden Lagan instead of Balagan. I love that. Biden Lagan. Yeah, that's oh, that's really good. All right. uh, Christy, we love you, sweetheart. Change your last name in your old account. <laughs> thank you, by the way, for the super chat. Freddie Ramirez, thank you. And waiting on the Lord, you say, God bless you both. Uh, Bibi should tell Biden this. Uh, when you have over three to 4,000 years of war under your belt, then you can lecture me how to fight my battles. No. Until then, keep your pie hole shut and support us all. I love that. That, that would, I, I would. I would pay a lot of money to be in the room <laughs> when Bibi said that to, to that creep. That'd be that. That would be that would be. Great. By the way, it's not only him; it's, it's it's the whole administration. Your your whole higher. Oh yeah. You've got a whole load of of people who who haven't figured out what their identity is. Man, is it ugly? Yeah. Man, is it? it it's, so it's, this it's, is, this is going to be a very illuminating week. Yeah, it's uh, man, it's some level of ugly. So, all right. Well, guys, uh, we are uh, definitely, we're thankful for your prayers. Uh, oh, Tommy's been watching us. I didn't even see the text that Tom sent to us. Oh. Yeah. God bless you, Tom. I didn't even notice that he sent a text. God bless him. All right, um, guys, we love you. Let's close in prayer. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll get on the locals. We'll jump on locals in about five minutes, okay? Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord, for this time that we can get together, Lord. And we do pray, God, that you would protect your people, Lord. We pray uh, for Israel, Lord. We know, God, that you uh, have always had big plans for your people, Lord, and that they're not going anywhere. And Lord, we're just so thankful for that, Lord. Continue to protect them. Have your hand upon them, Lord. Give wisdom to the leadership, Lord, that the right decisions would be made. So Father, we just love you and thank you. We look to you and we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys. God bless you. We'll see you on see Locals you uh, shortly. Bye-bye.